Hello, and welcome to a special three-part edition of Ethics Express, where we're going to discuss the topic of government ethics laws in principle and in practice. Here joining us today to do that is Mark Davies. Mark is the executive director of the New York City Conflicts of Interest Board, and he's also the chair of the New York State Bar Association Municipal Law Section. In this first episode, we're going to discuss the general history and purpose of government ethics laws. But before we do that, Mark, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? You've been in the government ethics field for quite some time now, correct? Uh, about 25 years, that's correct. That's a long time. So how did you get into this field? Back when I was a full-time law professor, I was recruited uh, to uh, head up a uh, municipal ethics uh, unit for the um, Commission on Government Integrity. After that, uh, I was recruited to be the executive director of the Temporary State Commission on Local Government Ethics. Uh, and after that, I was recruited for, uh, for this position here. So you must like something about this field if you've been in it for 25 years. Could you tell us a little bit about what interests you about government ethics? I think the, the field is endlessly fascinating. Uh, you're dealing with people's conduct, their activities, their day-to-day -day lives. I mean, they're really the, the most important aspects of their lives in many ways. All right, so now let's get into discussing how the laws uh, address these important issues in people's lives and maybe first we could get into the sort of the general purpose of these rules. Uh, they're not really to catch crooks, are they? No, not at all. I mean, it is true that in, uh, in much of the world the government ethics laws are combined with anti-corruption laws uh, and, and so forth, but ethics laws themselves are really not aimed at catching crooks. They're really aimed at providing guidance to honest public officials. Uh, and there, so their purpose is not to catch crooks. Uh, their purpose is to promote both the reality and the perception of integrity in government by preventing unethical conduct or conflicts of interest violations from occurring in the first place. Okay, so you're distinguishing these rules, uh, government ethics rules, from criminal law. Um, they're also distinct from campaign finance rules, is that correct? Yeah, that's true. The, uh, they're all part of a package in a sense. That is, these rules will overlap, uh, they'll reflect upon one another uh, in terms of campaign finance laws, in, in terms of agency or uh, government uh, standards of conduct, sexual harassment laws, election laws, uh, penal laws, uh, as we mentioned. So they're, in a sense, they're all part of a, a, a complete construct. But we actually, in this country, really view them as distinct, despite they obviously are, are related to all these other laws. This idea of ethics laws to provide guidance to public officials, uh, it sounds rather progressive. Are these laws new? No, actually they go back uh, not even centuries but millennia. The earliest I've found was an ethics provision in the Code of Hammurabi, which was promulgated by the King of Babylon about 3,800 years ago. And then after that there were a number of ethics provisions that were related to very often uh, religious scriptures. Uh, so you'd, you'll find them in Hindu scriptures and Buddhist scriptures and Hebrew scriptures uh, and so forth. Then of course they, they became uh, more secular in Greece and Rome and uh, up through uh, uh, Charlemagne in 1254 the, uh, the King of France, King Louis uh, the Ninth, uh, promulgated quite extensive uh, government ethics regulations and so on up to, uh, up to the modern day. Uh, probably the watershed in this country was uh, the American Civil War uh, where Abraham Lincoln signed into, into law legislation really directed at addressing contracting scandals that were occurring during the Civil War when members of Congress, for example, in particular, were benefiting from, from government contracts. Uh, and so these laws go back quite a ways. Uh, how about in New York City? When did we get our first ethics laws in this jurisdiction? In New York City, the first law was actually in 1830, and it addressed this issue of having an interest in contracts, uh, public officials having an interest in contracts. Do we see much variation in how these laws are constructed? Um, are there different styles of ethics laws, if you will? Well, certainly uh, in this country, uh, there are basically two approaches. There is a values-based approach and there's a compliance-based approach. And the, uh, the values-based approach will promote and, and, and set forth positive values of public service. For example, a values-based ethics provision may say that a public servant shall place the interests of the public before himself or herself, whereas a compliance-based approach uh, is more a list of do's and don'ts, particularly don'ts. So it may say, for example, that a public servant may not accept a gift from 
uh, anyone doing business with that government. The advantage of the uh, uh, values-based approach is that it does promote positive values. The disadvantage is it doesn't provide a lot of guidance. It's, it's a little too vague, uh, and it also, for that reason, is not enforceable by way of fines. The advantage of a compliance-based approach is that it is clear, it's bright line. It can provide substantial guidance to public officials. The disadvantage is, of course, it's all negative, what you can't do as opposed to promoting uh, positive values. Hmm. And now which type of approach do you prefer, the compliance-based approach or the values-based approach? Well, really, we should have both. You, you should have uh, set forth uh, in, your, in your ethics law standards of conduct, ethics provisions, positive values that you want to reinforce. Uh, you, you're not going to be able to uh, enforce those with civil fines, for example, because they're too vague. But they do set forth the positive values. And then out of those values, you draw forth your compliance-based rules. So you really should have both. All right. So let's imagine that we're writing an ethics law and we've settled on a compliance-based approach, a values-based approach, or some hybrid of the two. Then we'd have to look at what kinds of issues are we regulating. Now, are, are the issues regulated by ethics laws the same across different cultures and societies, or do you find variation in the types of things that they address? Well, actually, the issues are amazingly the same. Uh, across cultures and, uh, and geography and jurisdictions and size of, uh, of government uh, and the number of employees, they're really, the issues are pretty much the same. What differs is the treatment, because the treatment will, of course, depend on all of those factors, on size and geography and, uh, and the jurisdiction and the culture and so forth. The treatment will differ. The issues are pretty much the same. Okay, so it sounds like every government could use some ethics laws. I think this is a good time to wrap up uh, this first episode. Please join us next time when we'll discuss how to structure a good ethics law. Thanks for joining us at Ethics Express. We'll see you next time.